Hi everyone, good Monday morning again from Base Leg. You know, I just wanted to have a little bit of a uh, primer on CHTs versus EGTs this morning because I've heard a number of comments lately from pilots that leads me to believe that not a real understanding out there of the differences and what you need to do in adjusting each of those. So let's talk about it a little bit. EGT stands for exhaust gas temperature. That tells you what's going on inside the cylinder, okay? That is controlled by injectors here. And I'm gonna get into those a little bit here in more depth. CHT, cylinder head temp, is a probe that typically uh, goes right into the cylinder head, usually they're underneath, or sometimes there's a spark plug washer on some of the lower end gauges as well. We'll go right underneath the spark plug. Basically what we're doing there is taking the temperature of the cylinder head. Down here is the cylinder barrel. By the way, this is an IO540 engine on my RV10. It's a Thunderbolt engine with about a thousand hours on it, a little over that right now, uh, and it's doing quite well. So what leads me to believe people don't understand is I've heard a comment more than once in the last month or so, when I ask somebody what they're working on, well, I'm working on cooling my engine, my EGTs are too high, so they're messing with the baffling. And that's just really, really wrong, okay? We really want to understand how much fuel this engine should burn. And if you look in your uh, manual that comes from the manufacturer, typically there's fuel flow curves at various power settings. The easiest way to make certain you've got the right fuel flow from what I would call the main jet starting is to see what the aircraft should be burning fuel flow wise at maximum power. So rated RPM, 2700 in the case of an IO540, full manifold pressure, about 260, 270 horse, should yield somewhere above 25 gallons per hour at takeoff power. If you're not getting that, the first thing you want to do is perhaps look at the main jet. And I'm going to show you those here in a bit. Maybe we can walk over here and just kind of start right here. Okay, main jets are actually down in the fuel servo. That's where the, the fuel first comes in, and then uh, the throttle position determines how much uh, fuel leaves that and goes up to the spider or the fuel distribution area. So these are main jets. These are actually out of uh, the Airflow Performance uh, FM200. They come in different sizes. And basically, the smaller the number, uh, you're going to get larger fuel flow. So like a number 40 main jet is going to deliver uh, usually a little more fuel than a 38 or a 37. Okay. Next, what happens, and we'll go back to the engine here in a bit, the fuel leaves the servo and goes up to an injector, uh, I'm sorry, the a spider on top of the engine, and that distributes the fuel to each of the cylinders. At each of those cylinders, this is on an injected engine, by the way, we'll have an injector body right here that goes usually into the top of each cylinder. And then in each of those injector bodies, there's an injector nozzle here. Okay, these go in right like this. These are all adjustable, meaning they're drilled different sizes. So what you'll do, and we'll go back to the engine here, and I'll show you this. Using your gauges in the cockpit will tell you what the various EGT temps are across the cylinder. And you can see the injector body installed right here into this cylinder. And they come out very, very easily. With a 3 8 wrench, you just loosen the line here that comes from the spider or distribution thing on top of the engine. Right there, you can see it's got stainless steel lines going to each cylinder. By the way, there's an AD. These stainless lines need to be clamped with a Dell clamps every six inches or so from the spider all the way out to the injector. Cable ties are not allowed. So you can see this comes out, and then this injector that I just showed you over there goes right down into the injector body, okay? So, once you determine we've got... It was at the injector nozzle? That's the injector nozzle going injector right into nozzle. the injector body, okay? And we're going to tighten this back up so we don't forget, okay? You don't want to over-torque those, just make them nice and tight, okay? So, cylinder head temp is going to tell us the temperatures, and there's specs on that for each engine. In the case of the IO540, 
500 degrees is max. Now you really don't ever want to run it that hot. Okay, somewhere around 400 plus or minus is really good. 430 is really a good cruise number in these uh, Lycoming engines at cruise power properly lean below 75% power. Okay, so cooling air is done with the baffling here. And that typically controls the cylinder head temps as long as we have the injectors properly adjusted, meaning we've got the proper amount of flow to each cylinder. How are we going to check that? What you're going to do is go up to like uh, 3,000 feet, somewhere where you can get 75% power or thereabouts, set it up for 75% power, and then slowly pull your mixture back about two tenths of a gallon uh, per hour, maybe every minute if you have a fuel flow gauge. Let it stabilize until you've got all of the cylinders peaked. And what you want to do is what, they'll start to fall off, meaning the EGTs will rise, 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 and they'll start to fall off. The idea is to get them all peak at the same time or close to within 0.2 tenths of a gallon an hour. This is all detailed on uh, Airflow Performance website. Uh, Don there has done just a really great job with this stuff so we can all understand it. And so you want to get those balanced. Now, high EGTs can cause high cylinder head temps, but if you've got too little fuel flow going to the cylinders, no amount of cooling is going to help EGTs. EGTs are controlled by the fuel, by this nozzle, okay? Cylinder head temps are controlled by the baffling. That's cooling air to the cylinders, okay? So the big picture here is, if you have high CHTs, the first thing you might want to take a look at, and we've already talked about this in prior videos, but let's take a look at simple things like ignition timing. Make certain your main jet is proper and you've got the right fuel flow. Then go after EGTs. Once you've got all those squared away, if you still have a hot running engine, then it's time to look at baffling and making certain that everything is all right for the baffling, okay? Typically, you know, what happens over time, the baffling here is not seated very well up against the uh, upper uh, cowling. You can have leaks, your inner cylinder baffles underneath, and you can take a look in my book and see pictures of those, but those need to be wrapped around the lower part of the cylinder. They're tied together usually with safety wire or some rods, and those can break, and uh, the inner cylinder baffles down there uh, wrap around underneath can open up, and you'll get high cylinder hep temp showing up all of a sudden on the front and the rear cylinders usually. Uh, on four-cylinder engines, that's all you have. On the six-cylinder engines, you will have, I don't know if you can get a picture of this, what's called inter-cylinder baffles straight down inside there. Those are held on from the top here, kind of somewhat spring-loaded, and that keeps the air going down through these cylinders properly. Okay. The idea for cooling is we want this air to wrap around the cylinder. Okay? It, just going straight down won't cool that cylinder properly. So those, the uh, aluminum there really needs to be wrapped around. Sometimes what will happen, you'll have those too tight on the cylinders. And I think I have a picture of this in the book as well. The fins here from vibration over time will actually cut holes into those lower cylinder baffles. And all of a sudden we don't have an airtight solution anymore. So, uh, again, just wanted to help everybody understand EGT versus CHT and some of the things you need to do differently there to attack each one. And I can't close this one out without talking about some jam nuts again, okay? I kind of thought the plague was over, been writing about it for years, you know, we coined the phrase for the company, and uh, things got well for a number of years. And in the last few months, I'm seeing more and more loose jam nuts and no excuse. The most recent one I did a pre-buy inspection on an RB14 that only had 53 hours on it. And I walked up to it while I was kind of idly talking uh, to the seller and put my hand on the jam nuts on the rudder spar and all three of them were loose. Now the sad thing is this was an airplane that was built out of country, so it was licensed there. It's had phase one flown off. It came to this country, got a new airworthiness certificate, which typically requires another DAR inspection in this country to issue an airworthiness certificate. And then uh, pre-flight anybody. So no excuse for 55 hours. Um, most recently this week, went and looked at another RV6 that was uh, uh, for sale. And uh, there was a loose jam up there on the throttle linkage. 
So uh, I would just ask you again to go out there and take a look at your jam nuts, especially those of you who have just completed aircraft. You might think you or somebody else looked at all those jam nuts. Uh, there's just too many loose ones out there anymore. So please go take a look at those. All right. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate it.